Well, happy Easter, everybody, and welcome to North Cross today. Uh, whether you're gathered here in a very full room or connecting with us online, I'm glad that you have an opportunity to celebrate the greatest event that has ever happened. Um, a few notes as we get started. First of all, if you're new or newer to North Cross, I want to give you a special welcome today. My name is Matt. I'm one of the two pastors at North Cross. I'll be kind of getting the service started uh, for the first part here, and then we're going to bring out our other pastor, Pastor Ben, and he's going to share an Easter message with us. For those who are in the room, you received a program on the way in that'll guide you through the service, and I'll um, highlight a couple of things in there in just a little bit. Uh, first of all, I know that our, our space here is a little bit close. Uh, we're uh, near, near some other people. Uh, just to keep in, in mind, uh, we do have a kids ministry that is meeting at the same time on the other side of the building. Uh, you might have seen that on your way in. And if that's something you want to check out for your kids, uh, they are more than welcome to do that. It's for kids age one through fourth grade. Otherwise, kids are definitely welcome in this space also. Uh, if, if they need to get up and move around during the service, our atrium is a great spot for that. You can still see and hear everything that's going on in here. So with that, I'm going to hand things over to our musicians in just a moment as we begin the celebration of Easter. And before we, we get started with that, I'll, I'll begin with a, just a really brief, brief question to get you thinking. How far would you be willing to go out of your way to help someone that you love? There have been a, a few times when my kids forgot some things when they went to school usually an iPad. And so I get the text message, or Amy and I get the message, could you please drop it off? Could you please drop it off? And there's that moment in my mind where I'm thinking, I've got a busy day. You know, I've got things that I want to do. But, but then obviously my father heart takes over. Of course, I'll go out of my way to bring your iPad to you. Maybe you've had moments like that in your life where someone whom you loved needed something and so it demanded that you would go out of your way for them. But what about God? Would God go out of his way to help someone like you? And maybe you're the kind of person who you came in here today thinking, I don't know if he would. I don't know if he could. But what we're, what we're going to celebrate today is that Easter is the answer to that question. Easter answers, would God go out of his way for someone like you? He would, and he did. We're going to celebrate that in our first song today. And so as we join with our musicians, I invite you to stand as we celebrate Easter. Lord, I confess that I've been a criminal. I've stolen your breath And sang my own song And Lord, I confess That I'm far from innocent These shackles I wear Oh, I bought all my Crimson cost You nailed my debt To that old rugged cross An empty slave At the empty grave Thank God that stone Was rolled away Lord I confess I've been a prodigal for your house But I walked my own roads And then Jesus came He tore down my prison walls Death came to life When He called me by name
amazing amount of good news that we have to celebrate together, and what an honor to be able to celebrate that with you. Um, so in just a moment, I'm going to have you sit down, but for, first, before you do that, um, do you want to say good morning, hello, happy Easter to someone around you? I'll take that as a yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, you can go ahead and be seated then. So, so what do you think? Would God go out of his way to help a person like you? That question has been on many people's minds. And some people come to different conclusions. Some people think, of course, God would go out of his way to help someone like me, because don't you know who I am? God should be honored to have me on his earth. Um, other people are the opposite. They say, there's no way... I, I, a perfect God could love or help someone like me. I don't deserve it. The truth that we see from Scripture is that all of us are cut off from God by nature. That all of us are born with a sinful nature that separates us from a holy God. We are darkness, and darkness cannot exist in the presence of light. And rather, rather than leaving us to find our own solution, which would never happen, God recognized that the solution to our problem would have to come from him. And so he went out of his way, sending his son to live among us, the perfect son of God, blameless in every way, so that he could give that to us as a gift. And then taking our sin and nailing it to the cross. But had Jesus stayed in his tomb, he would have been just like every other human being in this world, his death meaning nothing. But 
if he were to rise from the dead and have power over it, that would guarantee that God has come out of his way for you and he has brought you back to him. And so I get to share with you the good news of the account of the resurrection of Jesus from John chapter 20. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb, crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was him. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brother. I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the good news of great joy that is for all people. And in response, let us give our thanks and praise to God. I invite you to stand one more time, please. I cast my mind to Calvary. Where Jesus bled and died for me, I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree, his body bound and drenched in tears. They laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone. Messiah still and all alone.
Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for the, the unearned, amazing, eternal love that you have shown to us. Even when we were dead in our transgressions and sins, even when we were enemies of you because of our sinful nature, you demonstrated your love for us in this, that you sent your son Jesus to be our substitute both in life and in death. And since we are connected to him by faith, we are also connected to the power of his resurrection. So I pray your blessing on the people who have gathered or who have connected with our, our service today. We come from so many different backgrounds, so many different things going through our minds, but your word is so powerful, it can speak to everyone here where they are at. And the universal truth that we all cling to is the message of hope in Jesus Christ, both in his death and in his resurrection. And so bless us in this place as we take this truth and build our lives upon it. I ask that blessing in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. You can go ahead and be seated. Big thank you to our musicians who have uh, prepared to lead us in worship today. Uh, they'll come out one more time at the end of this service as we have a, a final closing song. In just a minute, I'm going to welcome out Pastor Ben, who's going to be sharing an Easter message with us today. Uh, before that, just a few um, things to keep in mind uh, when it comes to the, the service and also what's going on around you. Um, so... Uh, when it uh, comes to what you received on the way in, if you're in the room, uh, you received a program with a few things in there. One thing is a blue sheet with some message notes. So if you're new to North Cross, that'll guide you through Pastor Ben's message, and you're welcome to use, use it to take notes or just follow along, however it works best for you. Um, also, one thing in that handout is a connection card. Uh, that connection card is an easy way for the members of our church family to let us know they were here and share any prayer requests. But also, it's, it's useful for guests. If you want to take a first step to connecting with us and you want to share a little bit of information or ask, ask some questions, that's an easy way to do that. So if you do fill out a connection card today, which I hope you do, uh, you can leave it in one of the baskets on your way out after the service. And also, those who are connecting with us online, we have not forgotten about you. If you want to let us know you are here, you can look in the description of the video or just go to northcrossmn.org and you'll see a link to a connection card there. And then uh, finally, uh, if you have a connection card and if you're a guest and if, if, you, if you want more than just a basket, if you want to put it in the hand of another human being, you are welcome to do that also. You can go to our welcome center after the, the service, and you can hand in your connection card. You can introduce yourself. If you have any questions, you can ask questions there. And also at the welcome center, we have a gift if you're interested. It's a small book called The Case for Easter. Um, some of you might have questions about what Easter is all about. Is it just a legend? Has it been exaggerated over the centuries? What is the real story of Easter, and how can we be sure of what it is? So this very short book uh, invites you to go through a little journey to look at the actual history uh, behind the resurrection of Jesus and whether that historical account can be trusted or not. And just it, it, this is a spoiler, but it can. So th this, this book uh, guides you through that process, and if you'd like one, uh, they're free gifts. We have them available at the Welcome Center during or after the service. That's all that I've got for you. In just a moment, we're going to welcome out Pastor Ben for the message. But first, here's a little uh, video to set up the message. Happy Easter, everyone. Has anyone told you yet this service that we're glad that you're here? Whether it's uh, those of you who are able to find a seat in the room or 
I see you back there in the atrium. You're waving at me. We're so glad that you're sitting uh, back there and, and joining us in the atrium. And then obviously everyone online. Um, when we say that we're glad that you're here, I want you to know that those aren't just some hollow throwaway words that I or Matt are saying. Um, I am so excited to be able to spend part of this day with you, and I'm even more excited to be able to share the message of Easter with you. And one of the things that I've noticed over the years of being a pastor, and especially a pastor on Easter, is that this on the screen, that people come to church on Easter for different reasons. So there's a large segment of people here today or watching online that when it comes to being at church on Easter, there's like no other place you would be. Like it's not even a thought. I'm going to be in church. I'm going to be worshiping Jesus. I'm going to pray. I'm going to, to celebrate this day. And if that's you, we're glad you're here. There's other people at Easter who are here because you had a neighbor or a friend um, who kept pestering you about coming to church with them, and you took them up on their invitation, and you're here today, and we're glad that you're here. There's another segment of people who don't come to church very often, but one of the things you just intuitively know or he or she told you, a relative said, typically it's a mom, but it could be a spouse, like, what I really want at Easter more than anything else is if you and the kids and the family could sit next to us and we could go to church together. And if that's you, we're glad that you're here. There's probably another group of people that haven't really thought a lot this morning about why you're here in the sense that it just took a lot to get here. And going to church is just kind of part of what you do at Easter. There's baskets and eggs and chocolate bunnies and peeps, of course, and church. It's just part of the deal. Here's something else that I know about a group that is this large, is that when it comes to the service so far, that depending on who you are, it's connected in different ways. So our second song today was called You've Already Won. And it's a song that just oozes triumph and joy and victory and hope. But here's what I know. There are days when life doesn't feel joyful and victorious and triumphant. That in fact... Your life today or this week or this year doesn't feel as victorious and happy as the songs that we've been singing. And if that's you or a little part of you, I get that. And so you might be asking yourself the question, so is, is Easter like Disney World? It's just a place you go for a day to sort of ignore reality and live in kind of a fantasy world? Is, is it a place you go and there's princesses and pirates and a talking mouse and there's good music and smiling faces and good food like donut holes, of course. And it's just an escape for a day. But then in about 30 minutes, we got to go back out into the world and face what's really true, my real reality. Is that what Easter is like Disney World? Did I tell you that I'm glad you're here? And here's the reason. Because those types of thoughts about Easter, which we can all have at times when we sort of compare reality sometimes with this celebration, those types of feelings about Easter, like it's Disney World, it's just a mere caricature of the truth and the reality of what we celebrate today. So what I want to do with you today is to get real and to talk about reality. Um, we are a note-taking type of church, so if you have your sermon notes out, our first fill-in for today kind of helps us know where we're going. Easter isn't about ignoring reality. It's about better understanding reality. So let's start very real, 
in regards to what exactly are we celebrating today. It, it's been mentioned or hinted at already. But Easter is not a celebration of religion or church. Easter is not a celebration of um, lives that are perfect and happy every day. Easter is the celebration of an event. That 2,000 years ago, there was a man, history tells us, and so does the Bible, a man named Jesus who lived in Israel. And that he was more than a man, he was the Son of God. And throughout Jesus' 33-year life, there were many glimpses of the reality that he was more than just a man. Like Jesus turned water into wine, and he healed lepers of their skin disease, and he helped the paralyzed walk. He even raised people like Lazarus from the dead. But the greatest proof that he was more than just a man is that he predicted that he would be crucified and then on the third day he would rise again and then he pulled it off. That's what we're celebrating today. That is the heart and core of what it means to follow Jesus. Now, if you're anything like me, you have questions about God. You wonder, why do bad things happen even to good people? Or why do bad things happen to me? You wonder about a six-day creation. I have four years of theology undergrad degree and then a four-year seminary degree, and I'm going to tell you, I still have questions in certain aspects of God. But what I love about Easter is that it clarifies things to the heart and core because none of those questions and none of those things are as important as what we are celebrating today. And that in fact, when we recognize and understand that Jesus rose from the dead, that all of those other questions don't become totally unimportant, but at least for me, they've become less important. They've become smaller. Now, this whole line of thinking about how important Easter is, and there's nothing more important than it, it's not just a sermon introduction that I came up with. It's what a pastor named Paul in the first century wrote all about by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. See, there was a group of Christians in a Greek city called Corinth that were struggling with the concept of a resurrection of the dead. And Paul, their founding pastor, um, wrote to them. And we're going to read what he wrote. We're going to start in verse 3 of 1 Corinthians 15. Paul wrote, For what I received, he, he's talking about a message, I then passed on to you, Corinthian Christians, as of first importance. So I'm going to pause there and just point out what Paul is saying is, what I'm going to tell you next is the absolute most important part of my ministry. There's nothing more important in what I talked to you about, what I preached about, what I wrote about, nothing more important than what comes next. And then he says, here it is, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scripture, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day, according to the scripture, and that he appeared. There's nothing more important that I preached to you, that I taught you, that I talked to you about than this. And when you look at the history of the first century church, so in that first hundred years after Jesus rose from the dead, the book of Acts, A-C-T-S, is a history of that early Christian church. Whenever the disciples had a chance to preach a sermon. You know what they preached about? It wasn't a marriage series. It wasn't a, a series about, you know, hot cultural topics. Every single time, the heart and core of their message was this. Christ died and was buried. And we saw it. He rose and he appeared. This became the credo, the centerpiece, not just of Paul's preaching, 
but of the early Christian church. Why was it so important? Let's skip ahead to verse 17. Paul writes, if Christ has not been raised, if there was no Easter, your faith is futile. Your faith is unimportant if Christ had not been raised. It's worthless. There's no point to it. And I want you to know that too. Like there's a lot of good things that the church at large does in the world. I know that North Cross, we do some good things in our community. But without the resurrection, we're just a civic club doing good things and being nice to people. And to be honest, my career, if there was no resurrection, is kind of a waste of time. And the offerings that you give, if there was no Easter, is kind of a waste of money. And the time you spend volunteering at church is kind of a waste of time in some ways, if there was no resurrection. And and then Paul goes on to explain a little bit more. He says, because you are still in your sin. And I want to pick that apart today just a little bit here, where what Paul is saying is not just that you have sin. He says that if Christ had not been risen from the dead, your faith is futile because you're still in sin. You are stuck. Sin is what consumes us. The definition of sin is just missing the mark, not, not following God perfectly. That's, that's what sin is. And Paul writes, if there's no resurrection, you're in it. Have you ever been stuck before? I think for those of you who attend here often, I've shared this before with you that while I was at, uh, in high school and college, my part-time job was driving a truck for a lumberyard. And uh, so it was kind of one of those flatbed trucks that you don't need a CDL for. But I delivered some pretty large, you know, loads. In fact, one of the things I would often deliver were pre-built tool sheds, like 8x8 or 8x10. And what they'd do is they'd forklift the shed onto the back of the truck, they'd strap it down, and then they'd send out a senior in high school to go deliver it, you know? <laughs> and... Uh, when, when I'd get to the, the home where I'm delivering it, uh, oftentimes they would have us, you know, deliver it in the backyard. So you'd kind of have to, you know, drive through, through the yard and they'd show you where to put it. And then you'd unstrap it, lift up the hoist, and the shed would just kind of slide off in, into place. And, and typically that went really well. I was, I was at a homeowner who said, hey, uh, we'd like it, you know, delivered in the backyard. And that was pretty normal. The only problem was that this time it had rained a ton the night before. And so his yard was quite soggy. And, and I, I told him that. I'm like, you know, I don't know that this is the best day to deliver this shed. And he was pretty grumpy. I, I wonder if, you know, he had been waiting on it for a while or something, but he wanted his shed in the place today. I'm like, all right, here we go. So I got in the truck and I could still remember in my mind thinking, okay, maybe this won't be as bad as I think it will be. <laughs> and then, then I hit the spot where I knew it was uh, the wettest and it was worse than I thought it would be. <laughs> Because I, I went and my tires started spinning and his perfectly manicured lawn, the grass is starting to fly. And then what do you do when you're not able to move forward? I didn't know what to do. So this may be good or not good, but I decided then to put it in reverse. And I didn't move at all. I just started spinning in the other direction. There goes more mud and there goes more grass. And his nice lawn is now getting all torn up. And so what do you do if you went forward and backwards and you're not able to move at all? I don't know. But here's what I did. I tried to go forward quick and then backwards and kind of rock it out of the rut. And the rut just keeps getting bigger. And here's the reality. The more I tried to get out of the rut, the bigger the mess became. And I remember going back and forth, back and forth. And he's like watching from the side. And I'm sitting in the, in the cab just like, I don't know what I'm going to do. So I got out and walked over, this crabby guy with my head down. And I said... I told you so. <laughs> so I, I, said, I said, I'm really sorry about your yard, sir. You know, 
That's the reality of our lives with sin. You see, we live in a culture, and, and maybe you have thought this before, that at the core, at the heart, we're really good people. We just, we just make mistakes every once in a while. Do you know if that was true, and I know we have some counselors in our midst, counseling would be really easy. Because all you would do is listen to what the people are either thinking wrong or doing wrong. And at the end, you'd write it all down and you'd say, stop doing that. And then they could. But do you know why it's hard? And there's a lot of reasons. But one of the reasons why it's so hard to change and to do the right thing or to think the right thing is because we're in sin. And you would think this would get a lot better the more you know about God. But there's a certain part of me that actually feels more guilty the more I know about God's plan. Because I recognize it's not just the things I do, but it's the things I think, it's the things I say. And then as I get older and know more about myself and think a little more deeply, I recognize there are so many things I do in my life, whether it's um, in my marriage or as a pastor, that I do the right thing, but I have the wrong motive. I, I do the right thing, but there's a part of it that like to make me look good or to get something back in return. And what I'm saying is, sin is not just a, a small disease. The reality, we're being real today, is it's a rut that as hard as we try, we cannot escape or get away from. And that is what Paul is talking about. Number two, being real. The reality is that our sin problem is worse than we'd like to admit. And if left to ourselves, it would be a pretty hopeless place to be, guys. It'd be like sitting in that cab, knowing there's a grumpy homeowner that you got to go talk to. You just tore up his lawn. What else does Paul say? If Christ had not been raised, your faith is futile, you're still in your sins, then, if Christ had not been raised, those who have fallen asleep, that is a New Testament way of saying, have experienced physical death. Those who have fallen asleep in Christ would be lost. If there was no resurrection or Easter, your physical death would be the end. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. What he's saying is, if, um, if there is no life after death, and you spend all of your life focused on, on Jesus, and it's just to have uh, a better earthly life, or just to have some encouragement, there, there can be some benefit there. But if death is the end when we die? In some ways, what was it all for? I should have just used my life <laughs> for myself. Because if there was no resurrection, our biggest problem would still be our biggest problem. Sin would still be our biggest problem. Now, as a pastor... You get to, every week, take the, the text, and you get to study it, and pray about it, and read through it, and look at it, and um, this section is obviously longer than what I get to preach on today. In fact, there's, there's verses 13 through 19. Um, Paul, in his writing by inspiration, he's kind of setting up this argument about what would it be like if there was no resurrection of Christ and all of the results that would happen through it. In fact, I have all the ifs highlighted. There's right here at least six ifs. If Christ had not been raised, your faith is futile. Our preaching is useless. The dead are not raised. We have no hope. All these things. But you know what Paul's doing here? He's setting you up. Because one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible is the next one. He's setting you up because the next word in verse 20, after all the ifs, is this one. 
in the Greek, it's nuni day, which is an emphatic way of saying there is something different than what I've been setting up. Now, um, in seminary, like, we're not the funniest lot, you know, so to speak. But I remember, I remember, you know, talking about this, this noony day in this verse. And, uh, and the professor saying something like this. I don't think he intended it to come out this way. But he said, like, this is the biggest butt in the Bible. <laughs> and I would agree with him. In fact, um, so that you don't forget it, so that you remember something. I, I blew it up here. Because as we already looked, the reality is if there was no Easter, there would be, well, no hope. Noony day. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. And how can Paul talk so confidently? He saw Jesus with his own eyes. Paul, the writer of the Corinthians, Jesus appeared to him and it changed his life. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. So he is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. It's kind of a Paul way of saying that Jesus is the first to rise from the dead, but he won't be the last. Because every person thereafter who puts their faith and trust in him will also receive the gift of eternal life. For since death came through a man, he's referencing Adam, the first man who sinned, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man, Jesus, the God-man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. Here's your next fill-in. The reality is, that sin is worse than we think. But there is rescue. We needed rescue. You know, I needed rescue that day I got stuck in the yard. And it didn't come the same day that I got stuck. <laughs> I had to wait the next day when a guy who had worked at the lumber yard for probably 40 years came. And I would like to think it just was drier, but more real is that he's done this before and you know it took like five minutes but he got the the truck out of the rut he he rescued me so to speak that's what jesus did for you sin's frustrating isn't it death stinks but jesus came and through his death and through his resurrection He's rescued you and given you hope. Your tires are not spinning anymore. You don't need to worry about your relationship with God because Jesus paid the price of your sin on the cross. And you know what Easter is? Well, one way to think of it is it's the receipt you get to hold so that you are aware and know that you are in possession of the best gift there could ever be. Life after death. See what I'm saying? Easter? It's essential. It's why there's not a week that goes by here at North Cross. If you're looking for a church like this, you, you found the right church, there's not a week that goes by at North Cross that we do not talk about the cross or the empty tomb or what Jesus did for you because our faith is futile if Jesus had not been raised from the dead. Now, I know that this concept of Jesus rising from the dead is something that can at times be, be hard to believe. I, I get that. It's not as easy to prove, like, you know, I can prove to you that I'm wearing a jacket today and I'm proving to my mom that I have my shirt tucked in this week, mom. She, she comments about my shirt being untucked on other weeks. But anyway, like, I can prove that to you. You know, most of history, you can't prove in that same way. 
But with the resurrection, there, there are things historically we can turn to. And if you want to learn more about that, I'd really encourage you to pick up one of those Case for Easter books. But in, in this section, what, what Paul does is he, he kind of, it almost seems as if he knew that people would, would still question whether Jesus rose from the dead. And so he addresses us. It's like he's, he's empathizing with the Corinthians and he's empathizing with you and me that we don't see people rise from the dead like on a daily basis, right? And, and so if you go back to our verses, he says, he was died, he buried, he was raised, and he appeared. And, and just side note, some of you may not know, but Jesus stuck around in the flesh for 40 days before he ascended into heaven. And there, there's probably more than one reason why he did that. But the one that, that I see is because he spent that time proving to people that he was alive. And Paul's calling that out. He's saying, okay, he appeared to Cephas. That was uh, another name for, for Peter, one of the 12. And then to the other 12. And then verse six. And after that, did you know this? Jesus appeared to more than 500. It wasn't just the disciples in the upper room um, or in the room. It was more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time. So there was this, this moment that we don't have recorded for us in the gospel where the risen Jesus appeared to a whole bunch of people. And then he goes on, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. And I love the color that Paul gives here with that statement. Because uh, recognize that Paul's writing this about 20 years after Jesus rose from the dead. So there are a lot of the 500, most of them, who are still alive. And what Paul is kind of goading the Corinthian Christians with is, if you don't believe that Jesus rose from the dead, take a trip to Israel, and there's a whole bunch of people that can tell you what they saw and what they experienced, and that Jesus, too, is empty. Now, as we close, I want to talk about one more part or thing of reality. The reality is that my life is not every day like Easter or as glorious as you've already won. The reality is is that in life, there is disappointment and there is heartache and there is the loss of loved ones who seem to, in our mind at least, died too soon. And there is war and there is economies that go up and go down. And then every four years, there's a presidential election. Let's buckle up for the rest of the year, right? Can I leave you with some perspective? Now, I have to say, I didn't come up with this illustration on my own, um, but I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, I saw a pastor uh, share truth in this way, and uh, it so stuck with me that I wanted to share it with you today. So, some perspective. I want you to view your life like the black tape at the end of this white rope. It's short. And for some people, it's 10 years. For some, it's 50. We have a, a member at North Cross, Marie. She's 105. But even 105, that, it's not super long. And, and during that lifetime, we experience a lot of things. Some of us get married and some don't. Some have kids and grandkids, and some don't. Some have a lot of earthly success and wealth and stuff, and some of us, not so much. What we all will experience in life is disappointment and heartache. Jesus, he said as much. So what does God do? Well, the first thing is, he's promised to be with you, the risen Savior, during the span of your earthly life, and to give you the strength 
that you need. But he also promises something else. He, he promises to give you more. So is it like, does he give me 100 years? To sort of equal the 100 years of, in a sinful world? 100 years of paradise to counteract 100 years of <laughs> this life. Or maybe it's 200 years. Or 500? At Easter, through Jesus, does he promise us a thousand? You know what he promises? Because of Easter, it's our fourth fill in. He promises you forever and ever and ever and ever. And he promises you joy and acceptance finally. And the battle being over with our sinful nature, where I don't need to battle it anymore. And he promises you grace, and he promises you love, and he promises you reunions with people that you miss, like my grandma Zastro, and my mother-in-law Terry, and my good friend Tim Peterson. And he promises you an existence with no more crying, or no more mourning, and no more pain. He promises you forever, and ever, and ever. And if I could get to the end of this hundred-foot rope, which I won't, he promises you more than that. How can you be so sure? Because the tomb is empty. Christ is risen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that when you saw us stuck in sin, you didn't merely make our earthly lives better. You did something better. You gave us eternity to look forward to not because there's anything good about me, but because you've transferred your perfection, your son's goodness onto us. And now you call us your children. Lord, when you go out into the world today, there's going to be difficulties. There always will be. But Lord, may the joy and victory of Easter stay close to our hearts may it be what we look forward to forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Our last song uh, is one that's going to remind us that the greatest miracle you've experienced is being called God's child. But before that, receive the blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. I invite you to stand. I shouldn't be alive My future was six feet under One foot in the grave No hope to be saved I shouldn't be alive But I'm a miracle child Defied every diagnosis as close as it came I can stand here and say I'm a miracle child
Well, it really has been a joy to be able to spend Easter with you. A couple quick things. Uh, if you enjoyed being with us today, there's a couple next steps you can think about. Next week, we're starting a brand new message series called The End of the World. It seems like a lot of people have had questions about the end with all that's going on. This is a series where we're going to take away your fear and give you encouragement. The other thing is if you're brand new to North Cross and would like to learn more, uh, we have a group called Starting Point that will be starting on April 16th. You can register or find more about it on the events tab of our website. But uh, otherwise, have a great week. The tomb is empty, Christ lives, and you get to live forever. Have a great day. Thank you. You're